you're listening to Let's Talk Creation. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And we're coming on to the end of the year, Paul. And here in America, this month, November, is well known for our holiday of Thanksgiving. I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no Thanksgiving in, you don't even have a Thanksgiving Day somewhere other in the year, do you, in the UK? No. No, no that's right. No. Right. Yeah. But from what I hear, uh, from what I hear, it's something I would enjoy. Uh, it's, <laughs> it sounds like a, <laughs> yeah. it sounds like a great feast. Yes, it is a great feast. That's the center, center point of the day is the feast with the turkey and the mashed potatoes and the, uh, the sweet potatoes and the, and the pumpkin pie. Yeah, it's good. And then some people watch uh, football games on Thanksgiving and some people watch the parades that go on in our cities. Um, it's kind of a big deal, but ultimately, Paul, it's really supposed to be about, um, being thankful, right? Yeah. And I remember when I was growing up every now and then, um, (laughs) every now and then my, my parents would decide, okay, we're going to, this Thanksgiving, we have to say something that we're thankful for as we go around the table. And so and I'm like, all right, I got to think of something to be thankful (laughs) for. This wasn't every Thanksgiving, but you know, once in a while they, they put you on the spot. All right. So, and being the smart aleck that I am, I would say things like, oh, I'm thankful for this food on the table that I would like to eat now. Um, and then mom would go, oh, Todd. Uh, yeah. Sorry, mom. <laughs> um, but it, but it put me in mind. I mean, we, we still got a couple weeks to go here before Thanksgiving comes around. And it put me in mind of thinking about um, God's creation. I've been thinking a lot about this lately uh, in terms of, well, the, just the way, the way that we approach the things that God has made, not just the things that God provides, the food, the shelter, the job, whatever, but the, just the gratuitous wonder and beauty of the world in which we live. Um, it's somewhat breathtaking. Um, as we record this, I'm in my cabin. I'm looking out my window. The fall foliage has is in full swing here. I've got these beautiful red maples. I've got uh, yellow leaves here as well. I've got some oak trees. The oak trees are dropping acorns on my roof and scaring me good. But other than that, it's quite nice. <laughs> so it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful day here in East Tennessee, and I am very thankful for it. So I, I thought maybe we should have an episode here that we devote to just you know, the wonders of creation and being thankful for, for the things that God has made. And as we were sort of thinking through and planning this, I I remembered, you know, when you read through the Psalms, one of the things that you come across time and time again is praise linked to creation. Either Mm. the psalmist is asking us to join creation in praise, or he's asking Creation to praise, which is a really interesting concept. Um, asking this, this, the, the, the inert world around us to praise God and then the living world around us to praise God. Or he's simply telling us to praise God because God is the master of creation. So you got a, you got a favorite psalm there, Paul? I have. Uh, yeah, as I was thinking about uh, the theme for today, um, I turn to one of my favorite psalms, and I, I, I may have said this before. It's Psalm 111. And verse 2 of that psalm says this, um, The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who delight in them. I think that's a, just a fabulous verse, isn't it? Yeah. And the rest of the psalm, as you read through it, speaks about all of the works of God in all of their many aspects uh, and how they display his glory and his righteousness and his compassion and his power. And it speaks about the works of God in providence, in the history of the people of God and, you know, in, in redemption. 
And verse four of that psalm uh, says this again, a verse I love. It says, he has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Uh, so, you know, it it just reminds us, doesn't it, that we're we're to think about the works of God. We're to meditate on them. We're to study them. Uh, we're to search them out diligently and, and learn from them. Uh, and the other thing that the psalmist says is that as we do this, it should draw us towards praise and worship and adoration of the creator himself. Uh, in fact, that's how the psalm begins. If you look at verse one, it says it begins with praise the Lord. And it's how the psalm ends. It, it ends in verse 10 with his praise endures forever. So it's a psalm that's just sort of full of um, rejoicing and praise as we meditate and dwell on the things that God has done. And yet what sort of strikes me as I, I read a psalm like this is how so often, even though we're sort of surrounded by reasons to praise God, you know, things that God has done in our lives, things that we can read about in Scripture, the redemption that he's provided, the, the amazing wonders in nature. We're surrounded by all of these good things. And yet so often, and I, you know, I speak for myself, we, we find ourselves sort of cold and unmoved yeah. by all of this. Yeah. Uh, when we, we really ought to just be full of praise and rejoicing. And so I, I love this psalm because it reminds me that the more I discover about what God has done, about who God is, uh, about his acts in creation, providence, redemption, the more I should be drawn to worship him. And so, yeah, that's that's one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 111. And in many ways, that, that verse that I read there, verse 2, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who delight in them. For me, that's kind of a motto verse for the ministry that I'm involved in, sure. uh, in, in biblical creation trust, because I, that's what we're called to do. We're, we're called to study God's works and to have pleasure in them, to, to delight in them. And so, yeah, if people want to know, you know, why do I do what I do? Psalm 111 verse two sums it up. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who delight in them. Yeah, you're right, Paul. I mean, it's, it's so easy for us to, to just become numb, right? I live, right. I live out in the countryside, right? I, I, during the summer, I cannot even see my neighbors. That that is how dense my, the forest is where I live. Uh, and you know, a lot of days I just walk out and get in a car and go to work and don't even think about the beauty of where I am. Every now and then, you know, we might have somebody over, or we might, uh, you know, somebody might come by and and they'll comment on how beautiful uh, our home is where we are. And oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. We good. Just take, for we us take to it for stop. granted, don't we? we yeah, we, we do. We just we just take so many good things for granted. We don't appreciate them in the way that that we should, and we don't praise God the way that we should because of it. Yeah. And I think the other the other concern I have about this is you know in our line of work, right in the creation evolution debate, I think too often we we might consider the value of a created thing only in terms of how we can use it to score points against yeah. our ideological opponents right um right so people might say I, I don't care about that i don't care about salamanders or i don't care about flowers because nobody cares that's not where it <laughs> is right human origins yeah dinosaurs that's what people care about the rest of it is just fluff um and that's you know it's a very pragmatic way of thinking about things and yeah. i and i certainly sort of understand it but at the same time no absolutely not <laughs> there is mm -hmm. the wonder of god's creation in the lowliest of things just as much as it is in the things that seem to be quite popular and people care about absolutely yeah so todd and um I think you've got a Bible verse as well that you wanted yeah, to yeah, I wanted to sort of share as we think about this theme. Is that right? Share. Yeah, let me let me share this other verse I was been thinking about here. This is from 
This is from Philippians. Everyone will be familiar with this, I would say. Um, Philippians 4, um, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Um, it's a startling passage in a lot of ways, I think. The idea that we should always yeah. be rejoicing. Don't be overcome by your anxiety, but trust in God's care. And even in the difficult times, right? The times when you think, you know, why, why is this happening to me? And we all have those times as well. Yeah. But this whole, the, the conclusion here, the sort of the, the crescendo of, of thinking about what is true and honorable and just and pure. And again, I'm reminded of, of these sorts of debates that we often find ourselves in the midst of where, you know, I see people spending huge amounts of time studying that which they despise. <laughs> Right. <laughs> they're they're going through all these books looking for looking for cracks and and faults and and trying to come up with more reasons why you shouldn't trust this guy. And and I think to myself, I need to I need to be balanced in the way I approach everything. Right. I need to not be overcome by the anxiety of so and so is saying things that are false, which for scientists is an ongoing anxiety <laughs> and it doesn't matter if i'm looking at some crazy facebook post about dowsing or if i'm hearing someone talk about evolution it's all mm, i don't know about that um but i have to balance that with the beauty of what god has made and and the wonder and the things that are good and praiseworthy and 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 I have to make sure that those things are filling my mind, not so much the things of the faults, right? Because I've seen, unfortunately, um, sometimes people who become obsessed with those, with the, with the ideology that they disagree with, uh, you'll find them embittered, really. I mean... Eventually, there comes a point when you realize this person isn't going to listen to me, and no one's listening to me, and now I'm just angry all the time, and I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to be poisoned by that. So yeah. So I think it's important yeah. for us to sort of step back and think about. Yeah. Think more about the things we're thankful for. Yeah, I th I think that's right. You know, obviously there there is a time and a place for critique, even refuting arguments for for you know tearing down false philosophies, false ideas. Sure. But if that entirely shapes us, then there's there's something wrong. We've we've kind of got an imbalance, haven't we? Yeah. Um, because what we what we should be shaped by are the good things, the positive things, the you know the 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 things that scripture tells us are true and worthy and honorable things that we should we should dwell on the the good gifts that, that God has given to us do, do you know as i as i was i knew you were going to read from that passage and i i actually looked up um matthew henry's commentary cuz i i just wanted to see what matthew henry had to say about um that passage and this is just an aside really but one of the really interesting things that matthew henry says um as he comments on, on these verses that you've read, he said this, the apostle would have the Christians learn anything which was good of their heathen neighbors. We should not be ashamed to learn any good thing of bad men 
or those who have not our advantages. And, you know, I, that, that just really struck me because um, what Matthew Henry is saying there is that we can actually learn good things from people who are not Christians. Right. Um, you know, sometimes as creationists, I think we are so suspicious of learning from non-Christians, particularly things about science. You know, we're, we're deeply suspicious of those who perhaps are, you know, evolutionary in their thinking. And we can sort of almost have a knee-jerk sort of reaction, you know, against anything that they, they have to say. And, of course, we do have to carefully reassess Absolutely. evolutionary claims, evolutionary interpretations. Absolutely, we do. But we can learn from our non-creationist colleagues and peers um in fact sometimes because of the particular knowledge that they have or the particular skill set that they have or their area of expertise sometimes they're the best people to teach us things um and yes. yeah th this is just an aspect isn't it of common grace mm -hmm. so sure you know we should always be on the lookout for the way that you know vain unbiblical philosophies have you know, affected the way that people think. But Matthew Henry reminds us we can even learn good things from bad people or from people who don't share our Christian perspective, you right. know. And I just thought that was that was fantastic. Um that that you know common grace means that you know we have good gifts even from people who don't know God. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And that is and it's a startling thing it's not just sort of practical but sometimes god can use god can use god can speak to us from anywhere through anything and sometimes in my life i've noticed you know, a random billboard is just mm -hmm. what i needed to hear which what and how and i don't know i cannot explain it i you know i'm not i'm not even going to try to tell you the story because it's weird but yeah <laughs> yeah Sometimes God punches through our, our, I don't know, our, our, you know, we're stuck in a rut and God sort of gives us a push. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And, and encourages us through, through things that you would never expect, you know? Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's have a chat here about some of our some of science, right? So you've you said yeah. you know that that uh, <laughs> great are the works of the Lord, uh, and and we should study them, right? That's right out of the Psalms. That that is 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 something that we should do. And as a scientist, I have continually through my career and my life been amazed and excited by things I'm learning about, either things that I'm discovering myself, um, which is, that is a lot of fun. <laughs> I got to tell you, <laughs> when you're the first person to see something or discover something and you yeah. realize, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, or just things that I've learned about. Um, now, when I was young and ambitious and um, mm. <laughs> fresh out of school and quite full of myself, um, I would read creationist magazines and things like that. And I would read uh, these articles, Paul, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, where they, they, will, they will talk about some amazing thing. The one I remember the most was an article about the yucca moth and how uh, the yucca moth is needed to fertile, you know, to propagate yucca plants. It's a symbiosis. It's a fairly well-known example of symbiosis. Um, and it's, yeah, it's complicated. And you get to the end of the article mm. and the article says, uh, after just, you know, spending most of the article describing whatever it is, whatever feature of mm. biology or creation it might be. And you get to the end of the article and it says, this is complicated, which means God is the only one that could have done it. And I used to pull my hair out when I saw that because I just thought, wait a minute, <laughs> how do you, how do you go from a, that to comp it's complicated to only God could have done this. That seems like a bit of a stretch, a bit of a leap there. Um, and I, I just found it 
very annoying as, as a young person, but I have mellowed over the years. And I mellowed because I realized those articles are worship articles. <laughs> right. That, that was never intended to be a design argument, right? It was never intended to, you know, present some sort of astonishing, astonishing, uh, irrefutable argument for God's uh, intelligent design in the world. Those articles were intended to make me stop and go, wow, creation is amazing and our God is amazing and praise the Lord. Yeah. I had to, I and had you to... don't have, and you don't have to be a scientist to, no. for this, right? Right. So that's the right. great thing. You know, we're talking, we're talking about science, but actually everybody can just look at the creation around them and just be astounded at what they see. Yeah. And, and deep down, no, you know, God, God is responsible for this. God, God yes. is behind this. Yes. You know. how, how, whatever it is, yeah. however it might have gotten to the state that it's in now, right? It has a history yeah. since creation. Um, it's all God's work, right? It's all God's handiwork. And we can all just say, yes, this is the work of God. Doesn't matter if it's complicated or simple. Um, it's all the work of God. Paul, do you have, a, do you have an example of, of a really cool design in creation that you like yeah yeah you know i i i, I do and I, i'll come to i i think you're absolutely right you know sometimes we just get so immersed in apologetics and i'm not and i'm not necessarily saying there's anything wrong with apologetics of course but sometimes we can just get, get so caught up can't we with the evidential value yeah. of these yep. arguments that we yep. actually just fail to just look at it and just go, like you say, wow, you know, yeah. stand, stand in awe. We, we, we want to jump straight to argument. Um, and ju just before I come to, to an example or two, I just wanted to share this because because this kind of came to my mind as I was thinking about this. That There's an old hymn um, by an Irish poet um, and congregationalist, George Wade Robinson. I, d I don't know if you know it. It's called Loved with Everlasting Love. And... I've always been struck by the second verse, which says this. Heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. Mm. And, you know, mm -hmm. when I hear that, I just think it captures a really important truth. That the fact that we are united with Christ as believers, that, that we have a regenerated heart, we ought to look at the world in a different way. You know, we, we, we ought to just be drawn to praise God because of what we see with new eyes, uh, because we're seeing it in a way that we weren't able to see it before. So, so what, what are my favorite design arguments? I, it's, it's actually really hard to choose because there are <laughs> kind of so many of these amazing sort of things in creation. I used to give a talk some years ago called Weird and Wonderful, where I just went through some of these amazing things, I, you know, like you say, not so much as an argument for God's existence or for design, but simply to kind of get people, you know, thinking about the creation and, and being drawn to worship God. And one of the examples that I used in that talk concerned um, some beetles known as Tok Toki beetles. I don't know if you've heard of these, but they're beetles... Not. They're flightless beetles. They live in the dry, hot deserts of Namibia. Um, they get their name, Tok Tokis, because of a clicking noise that they make when they tap their abdomen on the ground. And they're actually members of a very large family of, of beetles, uh, the Tenebrionidae, known as uh, otherwise as darkling beetles. And they live across southern Africa. There are about 3,500 species in the family, so it's a big, you know, big family. Uh, nearly 200 of them live in Namibia, and about 20 of the species actually live in the desert in Namibia. Uh, now, the, the Namibian desert is very hot and it's very dry, gets less than an inch of rainfall every year. And yet somehow, you know, despite these sort of blistering temperatures and the low level of rainfall, you've got these beetles that sort of manage to survive there. And one of the common um, species of Tok Toki that lives in, in the Namib desert is a beetle called the fog basking beetle. <laughs> it's called, it's uh, called what? Fog, fog basking? Fog basking beetle, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, it's about two and a half inches long. Uh, it lives on the um, faces of sand dunes or in the spaces between the dunes where you get windblown debris, and that sort of provides a source of food. And what it, it has a unique way of collecting water. So what it does is um, when the fog kind of rolls in off the Atlantic Ocean at night or early in the morning, this beetle climbs up the sand dune right to the top, and it does a kind of handstand. So it, it kind of tips itself up. So its, its head is down, its back end is up, and they face west towards the source of the moisture coming off the, the ocean. And the beetle has this sort of bumpy back, and the water condenses onto the back of the beetle. The moisture in the air condenses onto the back of the beetle, forms little water droplets which coalesce, and they trickle down the back of the beetle into the mouth parts of the beetle. And this is how it collects water. And in a single morning, it can drink about 40% of its own body mass, um, you know, in a, in a single morning. And then there are other tok tokies that kind of have other strategies. So there's another beetle that basically digs trenches in the sand. It digs trenches that collect the water, and then they drink the water from the trench. And yeah, I, I don't know why this particular example appeals to me, but I just think that is amazing. I, yeah. I just think it's extraordinary the way these beetles have been equipped to survive in this incredibly hostile environment where water is so scarce. I, you know, I just think it is, it's just an amazing provision of God for these, for these beetles that they're able to, to, to do this. Uh, so that's so that's a that's a fun example. Can can I give you one more? Yeah, um, absolutely. Is that okay? So again, this is this is from this talk that I used to give, and and it actually this example is from the plant kingdom because plants have got you know incredible things to to show us as well. So flowers, flowers have lots of ingenious mechanisms, as you know, to ensure that they get pollinated and cross pollinated. And one of my favorite examples concerns the bucket orchid of South America and Trinidad, which has this remarkable mutualistic relationship with orchid bees. Now, the bucket orchid um, actually doesn't produce nectar, which is what normally attracts insects to the plant, right? So what it does instead is it secretes an aromatic fluid, this kind of um, fragrant secretion it's composed mostly of compounds called esters which combine an organic acid with an alcohol and the male orchid bee is attracted by this perfume by this fragrance and it collects it it actually collects these secretions and stores it in glands on its swollen hind legs uh as, as far as I know, it's not entirely clear why they do this, but it's thought probably to be um, some kind of, they use it to signal to the female bees. So basically what happens is this, this male orchid bee comes along and it, it lands on the orchid and the orchid has this bucket-shaped flower. And because the surface where the bee lands is slippery, it slips and falls into the bottom of the bucket which has a secretion, this secretion in the bottom, which is fed by a dripping gland inside the flower. But the bee can't crawl back out the way it came because the, the orchid has these downward projecting guard hairs that prevent the bee from getting back out. So the only way for the bee to go out is to go to another exit point, which is this sort of narrow tunnel or spout. Um, and in the orchid, there's actually a little bump that's like a step that allows the bee to get out of the sticky fluid and up towards this, this tunnel. And um, when it goes into the tunnel, the flower parts um, grip the bee. And they apply a kind of dab of this glue-like substance to the bee and then attach pollen sacs to it. And the glue takes a while to dry, so the flower actually holds the bee 
for anything up to 45 minutes while the glue dries. And then it releases it and the bee can go off and visit other orchids and the pollen sacs get detached and the cross pollination uh, pollination process is completed. So again, you know, I look at this and I just go, wow, you know, this is such an incredibly ingenious mechanism. And it's also a lovely example of mutualism, you know, where the orchid bee and the orchid are both benefiting. Neither is harmed by what's going on. They both benefit. And I just look at that and I just think, what an amazing, amazing mechanism to ensure the pollination of this, this orchid. So th those are a couple of my favorite examples. <laughs> yeah, there are lots of examples of weird relationships between orchids and insects. Yeah. So, well, I have one. This this one this one is going to be outside the experience of most people, unfortunately. Okay. But it is one of my favorites, and I remember learning about this in grad school. This was this was literally when the research was happening, and uh, it was pretty exciting to hear about. But this is this is from my field, biochemistry, right? And yeah. so, in in inside of your cells, Paul, inside of my cells, inside of everyone's cells. We all have these proteins, uh, it's actually a complex of proteins, um, called F0, F1, ATP synthase. Wow. Okay. Very complicated, <laughs> very annoying name. Yes, we biochemists do love to, to needlessly complicate names, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so this, let's just think of it as uh, ATP synthase, okay? So ATP synthase makes a chemical called ATP. And ATP is basically what your cells use to move energy around, okay? So ATP is used for digesting your food. It's used for making uh, lipids. And it's used for signalings in cells. It's used for uh, replicating your DNA. It's used for making RNA. It's used for making proteins. Pretty much everything that your cells do, ATP is, is responsible. So you need a lot of it, right? So you have a lot of these mm -hmm. ATP synthase um, protein complexes. And when I say protein complex, I mean there's, there's a bunch of different protein molecules, individual molecules that all just sort of get together and do their work. Now, the interesting thing about a ATP synthase, uh, so it's... It, Part of it is this six-membered ring, right? And there are these uh, proteins that are that are very similar. So you have an alpha and a beta subunit, and they get together, and then they alternate around the ring. So you have six of them, three alphas, three betas. Every other one is an alpha. Every other one is a beta. And down the middle of this, there are these other proteins, very long and thin proteins that come sticking up the middle of this, of this molecule. And you might think, oh, that's kind of interesting, kind of like a mushroom, right? It kind of looks like a mushroom. Um, and it's really curious because the, the middle part of the protein is not symmetrical, okay? It's got a little nub that sticks out on the side, right? Which is really interesting. And so when we began studying this, biochemists began studying this, you know, everybody started talking about, I wonder if it turns, right? I wonder if this is literally a molecular wheel, uh -huh. right? So... You know, you, you've heard this before when you when you think about, you know, great achievements in the history of mankind. Well, who invented the wheel? Right. We always we always. <laughs> yeah. Human beings invented the wheel. Yeah. No, actually. <laughs> God invented the wheel. <laughs> so we started. So we started having these ideas. Maybe this thing <clears throat> is literally a rotary motor. Right. And if you turn it one way. It makes ATP, 
And if you turn it the other way, it burns ATP. It, it uses up ATP. And if you set it on the cell membrane in the right direction, <laughs> then some other chemical reactions happen and it will turn and make ATP. And those chemical reactions happen at sort of the end of digestion. That's, so that's basically, this is the culmination of what happens when you eat food <laughs> at a cellular level. So, yeah, so here's this wheel. So I'm in graduate school learning about the wheel. And this paper comes out, which is amazing. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Bonkers. The complexity of this experiment was <laughs> astonishing. And the results were fabulous. So, <laughs> so how do you prove, how do you show that ATP synthase is a wheel. Ah. This is one of those things that as a biochemist, you sort of have to figure out because, you know, you're, you're basically dealing with molecules that you cannot see with your eye, right? Lots mm -hmm. of other disciplines can see things that they study. But, uh, <laughs> but in biochemistry, usually you can't see what you're studying. Sometimes you get really big things that you can see, but most of the time you, you can't see it directly. So. So what these researchers did, which was really elegant, they used genetic engineering to create a special ATP synthase molecule. And on the, on the wheel part, the round, the six-membered ring, they added a long string of amino acids that would stick to nickel ions, right? So in the U.S., you're familiar with nickels, you have them in your pocket. Uh, yeah, so nickel is actually an element, and you can make ions of nickel. And there is an amino acid called histidine that will stick to nickel. So they made this this wheel protein with lots of extra histidines on it so that it would stick to nickel. Now, why? Because then they made this microscope slide where they covered it with nickel. They coated nickel all <laughs> over this microscope slide. So that meant the wheel would stick to it stick down onto the surface of the slide. Okay, so that's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two, they engineered, and this was, this was actually quite a bit more complicated, but they basically engineered the middle protein, the, 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 the round protein that goes down the middle, they engineered that so that it had this basically long tail on it that was connected to these fluorescent molecules that would glow, right? See where I'm going with this? Yeah, so, yeah right. So they, they make their microscope slide, which is pretty cool, with nickel on it. And then they put their, their engineered ATP synthase molecules on there. And the engineered ATP synthase molecules have, they stick down to the slide so that the, the round part doesn't turn. And the only thing that can turn is the middle part, right? So it's like, it's like you would hold on to the, the tire of your car and spin the axle, right? That's uh -huh. basically what's going on. So doesn't quite work that way, but you get the idea. So then they have this long thread that's connected to these, these, um, these fluorescent molecules. And then they just gave it ATP. And remember I said, this is one of those proteins that can go in either direction. You can set up a chemical gradient and make ATP, or you can just give it ATP and it will turn anyway. It'll turn backwards. And that's exactly what they did. So they put their microscope on these things <laughs> and they watched. They watched, and sure enough, they come up with these beautiful pictures showing the spinning of these, these molecules as they added ATP to the mix. It was, in my mind, this is one of the coolest uh, biochemical experiments I have ever heard of. Um, so elegant, so brilliant. Um, and there it is. Who invented the wheel? God invented the wheel. It's in every, it's in every cell of your body. It's in every cell of my body. We have, we have wheels. We live by the wheel, <laughs> quite literally. Um, yeah. just astonishing wow. thing. Yeah. It is amazing. Um, yeah, these little molecular machines, you know, motors and wheels and things. It's just absolutely yeah. phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. It and, is. and the ingenuity of the scientists who are able to yeah. sort of work this all out is also, you know, just, just quite remarkable. You know, it's, yeah, wow. Yeah, that that's that's fantastic. I I guess, you know, ha having kind of thought about some of these incredible things, 
Um, that brings us to another question. So how about this? You know, if when we look at the world around us and, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about the things that we're studying, whether it's, you know, biochemical machines or whether we're looking at orchids and their pollination or whatever it is. And if this is meant to draw us closer to God, as, we, as we've already said, how would you say in your own particular experience has your research um, helped you to think about God, who he is, you know, what he's done, that, that big story of creation right through to new creation, you know, how has your research helped you to think about that, that grand, that yeah. grand picture? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, my work in the past 13 years has mostly been about, um, human origins, right? And looking at and trying to understand um these fossil these fossilized ape man creatures right and i have found again and again that there are no actual ape men that there are apes and there are people uh and it's it's you know we can we can tell the difference uh, there's still questions i have still work i'm doing i'm just writing yesterday on a new paper that on on the subject, but but that's been my research. And what I found that that strikes strikes me again and again is that there are a lot of people out there who are don't look like me. <laughs> they don't look like me at all. Um, and I knew that, right? I mean, you can see the uh -huh. diversity in the, in the modern world. It's really easy to see, but. But with these, sometimes I would come up with this conclusion that, well, this, this, this fossil, it's actually human, which it doesn't look much at all like me. Um, and it makes me, I don't know, there's a certain discomfort to it because I thought looking at it, this is yeah. clearly not human and it's going to not be human. And, and then it turns out to be human, which makes me very popular with people. But anyway, um, <laughs> But it makes me think a lot about the image of God, right? Yeah. So when God made humans, he made us in his image, right? And it's a contrast in Genesis 1 to the repeated uh, phrase, after its kind, right? When God makes the animals and the plants, he makes them after their kinds. But when he makes people, he makes them in God's image. Yeah. So suddenly this is a real, this is a real big contrast. So, and, and of course, if you're studying fossils, one of the frustrations you have is that, well, I can't, you know, the, the image of God does not fossilize. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot, I cannot measure it. I cannot see it. Um, but it's there. It's there in all forms. It's there in all shapes and sizes of people. It's made me more. I think sensitive and aware of the ways that we all mistreat each other in the modern world. I think about, you know, every time, you know, violence breaks out between nations or even within countries, between different people groups, ethnic groups or tribes or whatever. Yeah, they're all we're all made in God's image. The the other may seem so weird to us, the other person, right? but we're all in God's image. And I also think about the end, the culmination, right? The kingdom of God. When every language, every tribe will be there together worshiping at the throne of Christ. And I think to myself, I bet some of these fossilized people that I know only from their skeletons, I bet they're going to be there. I bet there'll be some of them there. Um, and I often wonder <laughs> what those museums are going to be like on the resurrection day. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, yeah, yeah. When the drawers come flying open and the people are, are, are brought <laughs> back to life. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, 
it's an exciting thing. It's an exciting thought of that, you know, these, these individuals that I'm trying to, I'm trying to reconstruct what they were like and who they were. Um, but they're made in God's image. They're fallen like we are sinners like we are, but they're also, uh, able to be redeemed. Um, and if, when the Bible says there's people from every tribe and language and nation, okay, well, maybe that means every tribe and language and nation. Maybe some of yeah. these folks that I only know from their skeletons, uh, maybe they'll be there. Yeah. So how about you? Neanderta you, Neanderta you... Neanderthals in heaven, Todd. Is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to name names. Thought, I'm sure. The, the other thing that I think about is they have different names for themselves. Right. Yeah. We think yeah. of them as Neanderthals. They never thought they, of themselves they as that. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> and I'm right. eager to learn what their names really were. Um, yeah. 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 No, so, that, that's great. Well, from my own perspective, you know, I've spent a lot of time um, studying and thinking about um, rocks. And yes. I spent quite a lot of time studying one particular um, rock unit in particular, the Coconino Sandstone in Grand mm -hmm. Canyon. Mm -hmm. And as regular listeners, you know, may be aware, I was uh, a member of a team that was led by Dr. John Whitmore at Cedarville University. Um, and we carried out a major field and laboratory investigation of this particular sandstone layer. Uh, and we were especially thinking about the claim that the Coconino sandstone was deposited in an ancient desert. Um, as a windblown sandstone. And in fact, we found lots of evidence that it was deposited rapidly underwater. And I guess if people want to, you know, find out more about that, we actually did an episode uh, where we talked to um, John Whitmore all about it. It was episode 24, I think. So you can you can go and check that out. But as I, you know, as I was thinking about that, as I'm thinking about um, my work studying the Coconino, other other rock formations, um, obviously as a creationist, what's in the forefront of my um, thinking is the flood, uh, which was, uh, you know, a devastating judgment on human sin, uh, the worldwide flood in the, in the days of Noah, and. It's kind of ironic, uh, I, I often think, that so often we tell the story of Noah and the Flood as a kind of nice, sanitized yes. children's story. Children's you know, story, yeah. Child we give yeah, children's, children's books with pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, when in actual fact, it's one of the most horrific stories in the Bible. Yeah. Um, you know, this story of the violence and the corruption of that former world that was so great that God essentially pressed the reset button yeah. and wiped everything out and started all over again. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's an incredible um, sobering story of, of judgment, but there's also another side to the story of the flood. Um, and that's the story of God's grace. So, you know, we 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 know that in the midst of all of that terrifying judgment at the time of the flood, God provided a, a way of salvation. He provided an ark in which Noah and his family and representatives of all of the air-breathing birds and land animals were saved. And of course, as as Christians, um, you know, we are used to thinking of the ark as a picture for us of Jesus Christ, uh, the one today in whom we can find refuge and safety from a judgment to come. And of course, in Genesis 9, we read that after the flood, God um, set the rainbow in the clouds, um, a perpetual reminder of his mercy, um, so that when we see the rainbow today, uh, we, we're reminded that we live in an era of grace, an era when judgment is restrained, uh, judgment is held back, uh, so that there's time for us to turn from our sin, to turn to God, and, and to repent. Um, so I, th I, you know, all of those are thoughts that come to mind as I, as I study the rocks. But there's also another um, 
thing that I think about, and and it kind of um, it, it kind of fits with our theme today of thanksgiving. Um, it's another way in which God's mercy is evident in judgment um, through the flood. The way the way in which God actually made provision for us through the events of the flood. So if you think about the flood rocks, in those flood rocks, we have things like fossil fuels. We have coal and we have oil and we have gas that have helped to provide for our energy needs. We have mineral veins and metal deposits that we can mine and have innumerable uses in, in our modern world. Um, there are aquifers and springs that provide water. You know, basically, you know, the, these flood rocks are repositories for the water that we, that we drink and bathe in. And of course, we've, we've also just got the breathtaking beauty of, of places like Grand Canyon and other national parks, other wilderness areas, you know, both there in the States, here in Britain, all around the world, that really are scenery and landscapes that are a result of the flood. Yeah. And so, you know, that just makes me realize that even out of the rubble and the chaos of that lost world, that catastrophe that overwhelmed the, the world that then existed, God was actually providing for the people who had come afterwards. He was providing for us. Yeah. Um, and to me, that, that's just an incredible reminder, as the Bible tells us, that God is Jehovah Jireh. He's the God who provides. So that, you know, even in the midst of judgment, the judgment of the flood, God has used that to provide us with good things. And, you know, that that is just an incredible testimony to God's mercy and grace. He didn't need to do any of that, but he did. Yeah. And he provided for us and continues to provide for us and provide for all of our all of our needs. So those are just a few yeah. thoughts and causes for Thanksgiving from my studies in geology. Yeah, I've often thought about, you know, people you know, visiting Grand Canyon, looking at mm -hmm. the beauty of it. And I'm thinking, this is a giant scar. This yeah. is a giant scar on the planet. This is how yeah. much God hates sin, right? Yeah. When I do something wrong, this is how much he hates it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's It's a pretty graphic reminder. Yeah. And yet at the same time, he makes everything beautiful in its time, right? Even, even yeah. judgment. Absolutely. And, and terror. Yeah. Yeah, beauty from ashes. Beauty from ashes, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. we are about out of time. This has been a lot of fun. We should do this again. It's been fun. Maybe yes, every yeah. Thanksgiving. Maybe we should do this every Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's been great. Good, it's, a good, it's good to stop every now and then. Um, we spend a lot of time here on this podcast, thinking through, you know, critically thinking about all sorts of things. And it's, I think it's very good for us to stop and help our listeners and viewers, um, help our audience to sort of reset that, mm -hmm. that the creation is not here for you to make your apologetic arguments about. <laughs> creation is a testimony to God. It is a revelation of who he is. Um, yeah. And we ought to be grateful for it. So, Do you know, I think it would be appropriate to end this episode in a way that we don't normally kind of end episodes, and, and that's with a prayer. All right. And there, there's a wonderful prayer that I found. It's, it's in a collection of uh, sort of prayers and devotions. Um, and I've just a few lines from, the, from this prayer that I'd, sure. I'd like to read Sure. as we kind of close out. So... It says this, O Lord God, who inhabitest eternity, the heavens declare thy glory, the earth thy riches, the universe is thy temple. Thou hast made me what I am and given me what I have. In thee I live and move and have my being. I thank thee for thy riches to me in Jesus, for the unclouded revelation of him in thy word, where I behold his person, character, grace, 
glory, humiliation, sufferings, death and resurrection. Impress me deeply with a sense of thy omnipresence, that thou art about my path, my ways, my lying down, my end. Amen. Amen. I just thought that was a lovely prayer that reminds yeah. us of how much we have to thank God for. That's beautiful. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode. Um, do remember, if you are uh, watching on YouTube, leave a like and subscribe if you would. And uh, click the notification bell if you want to be sure to be aware every time we post new episodes. Um, if you're on a st other streaming platforms, we ha we're on most of the major podcasting platforms. Consider leaving us a review. That helps us share on your social media the episodes that you really enjoy. That also helps us a lot. Um, and let's also, as we're thanking the Lord, let's thank him for his provision for us. So we want to thank you, our listeners and viewers, our audience, um, for your generous sponsorship of the work that we're doing. Um, uh, the money for uh, production of this podcast comes from donations to uh, my employer, Core Academy of Science. Um, you can find us at coresci.org slash connect, where you'll find links to all of our important uh, content that we'd like you to be aware of, that tells you about our ministry, but also you can find their links to our donate page, or you can just go to coresci.org slash donate. That's C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot O-R-G slash donate, where you'll find ways that you can uh, help support uh, the work of our ministry and our podcast here, Let's Talk Creation. Paul, tell us a little bit about Biblical Creation Trust, our other sponsor. Yes, uh, do check out our website. It's at biblicalcreationtrust.org. And uh, if you go to the home page, there's a donate button and you can click on that. It takes you to a giving page and that explains all of the various ways that you can give to support the work. Um, including a PayPal account um, for those perhaps who are outside of the UK. And uh, you'll also find us on social media. We're active on Facebook. So do check us out and do continue to support what we're doing. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. And if you'd like to know more about uh, the podcast, check up on show notes and uh, archive of episodes. You can visit us at coreside.org slash podcast. Uh, if you'd like to contact us, we're on all the major social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, or you can send us an email uh, at podcast at coresci.org. And I do want you to know that we do check out every email that comes in. We may not always respond to everything that comes in, but we do read them. And maybe, maybe your comments and suggestions will be uh, future episodes. I know. Just this week, we had an interesting email that we thought, yeah, that would make a good episode or two, maybe. Um, so thank you for that. And do keep uh, continuing to uh, let us know how you like the podcast and what you'd like to see more of. Um, so that's it. We're back here in a fortnight, uh, Paul, with another episode of Let's Talk Creation. So we will see you then. See you then. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Let's Talk Creation. If you have questions, send them to podcast at coreside.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you.